and welcome to All Things LGBTQ, Youth, Youth Edition. Edition. My name is Oscar Newberger. I use he, him pronouns. My name is Jules Caserta. I use they, them pronouns. My name is Oliver Caldwell. I use they, ze, he pronouns. Today is an episode going on t with our mental health series. Today we're talking about self-harm. So trigger warning for, for self-harm uh, mention and talk about, talking about, and suicide. The date is June 11th. The date is June 11th, <laughs> 2018. All right, going into that fun topic, shall we start with our, shall we start with why people do it to start off? Why people self-harm? Sure. Why don't you start, Oscar? Can I see the notes? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I needed the notes because I have a bad memory. Um, so some reasons, do you want me to read all of them or just no, one? I want you to choose one, focus on that, and then we can discuss okay. that. It was un the instructions were unclear. I think you're unclear. Okay. Uh, so uh, one that I'm gonna pick is dysphoria because that's sort of something that I've struggled with in the past. Um, and so dysphoria can lead, lead to um, self-harm because uh, it's, a, because youth having um, really bad gender dysphoria and body dysphoria can can um, manifest itself into self hatred, which can manifest itself into try, wanting to hurt yourself. And I haven't struggled with self harm, and I'm lucky in in that way. But um, I do suffer from pretty severe uh, gender dysphoria, and feeling, n not feeling like you're in the right body, and I don't like using that term because that's a like very cis thing, is that mm -hmm. like you're in the wrong body, like I'm not, I'm in my body, but it feels wrong sometimes, and um, feeling, feeling like that all the time, it gets heavy, especially if you don't live in an accepting community. And I live in a very accepting community, my family is pretty accepting, and I don't have to um, not talk about it. I'm, I can talk about it, I can be open about it. I'm, I have the opportunity to actually transition. Um, and so I don't really struggle with thoughts of, uh, trying to hurt, of wanting to hurt myself um, because, because I am able to, to live authentically and be myself. And so the self-hatred that can come from having bad dysphoria doesn't manifest itself into me wanting to hurt myself as much as it could with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I think some people who have dysphoria probably use self-harm as a way to, um, I guess, like an alternative to what they want to do. Like if people want to transition and they can't transition, then instead they might like alter their body or hurt their body in other ways. Um, not that transitioning is hurting your body, but that that's sometimes a way for people to like cope with that when they can't do what they want to do. Yeah, I don't suffer from very high dysphoria and I also don't suffer from self-harm, so I can't really talk about how it affects dysphoria, that, how <laughs> dysphoria affects it that much. I mean, I know what dysphoria feels like. Like, I cry every time I go to the bathroom because that means I have to see that part of me. <laughs> but I don't. But Right, but you I don't, don't. I don't try. Yeah. yeah, it's never felt it in that way, but I can clearly see how that could definitely lead into self-harm. I think self-hatred just in general is the biggest cause of self-harm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, hating your body and hating yourself are two separate things because mm -hmm. um, you can hate your body without hating yourself and you can hate yourself without hating your body. So I think dysphoria, while it might be connected to like real self-hatred, is often just like hitting your body and I think there's a yeah like there's a line but that people often um, self-harm like regardless of what it is that they're unhappy with mm -hmm. self-harm can also like going off of self-hatred it can also be a form of punishment to that person like if you kind of if you do have self-hatred for your like personality or whatever it could be punishment for like say you said something weird in a conversation or you made someone upset that could cause you to potentially want to do that as like a punishment or like you failed it's like a, it kind of makes you want to find a way to punish yourself because like 
there isn't exactly a punishment, like a physical one. So it kind of gets people to focus on that and find a way to, again, punish themselves. I just sound like a broken record going back and forth. Especially um, when you, because a lot of times, like those little like social mistakes that can manifest themselves into wanting to self-harm and actually self-harming, um, often weren't as big as mm -hmm. your brain makes them out to be. And people who have like really circular thinking, um, like I, I have very circular thinking as a result of my OCD. And so um, I'll say one thing that's kind of weird or didn't really make any sense or was a non sequitur. And nobody having the conversation with me thought it was weird, but then I just think about it. And each time I think about it, it gets worse and worse. And then eventually I get to a point where I'm like, I am the worst person alive. And this was having this conversation was a mistake which wasn't true, and right. I just a, yeah. made a joke that nobody laughed at, yeah. which is very often because I'm not that funny and my sense of <laughs> no. humor is dry. You're but, hilarious, Oscar. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so getting into that circular thinking loop, and it's hard to step out of that, like an analogy, like that carnival ride where you get on and you hold the things and it spins in a circle. It's, it's like, wa like what? watching it is terrifying. I've never been on what it. What are you talking but, about? But so it uses like inertia or whatever. I don't mm -hmm. know the words. And it like, so you're, you, you stand up and you're holding onto these bars. They're right here and there's like a seatbelt. And you hold on, you stand against the wall and then it spins really hard. And then you're pushed against the back oh. of your seat and you can't, and like, you can't move. Yeah. And so like, that's kind of what it feels like is you're on that and you can't, you can't get out of it without help. Oh, I was imagining a little playground thingy. No, like, that, like I mean, that's a, that's a smaller scale example. <laughs> like, the merry-go-round is a smaller scale example of what I was saying, yeah, so. Yeah, but I totally agree with that, and I also deal with that a lot, where it's like you blow things out of proportion. Sometimes it can just feel like this, like, annoying, nagging voice in your head. Because, mm -hmm. like, it's not really you, either. Yeah. It's not, like, you thinking that. It's, like, I separate it. It's, like, it's, I'm not thinking that. This bitch is thinking that. It's not me. It's my that, goblin brain. Yes. My goblin brain. It's little gremlins that, like, devour in your head. Like, devour yeah. all your lo logical thinking. Yeah. Can lead to just wanting to be able to do something, focus on something, so you do yeah. that. Yeah. It's I think, kind of, like, uh, taking control. Yeah, I think people tend to think that, um, like, awkward stuff they say or whatever mistake they think they made is a lot bigger than it is. So you should know that, like, um, it's not... Like, it's not a big deal if you mess up in a conversation, and it's hard to, like, absorb that information yourself, but um, it's, like, it's good to be able to, like, try to understand that it isn't, um, like, a huge thing, and probably other people aren't even noticing the things you're noticing, so you shouldn't, like, resort to self-harm just because you, like, messed up in a conversation or had an awkward um, situation. Yeah. And another thing about it, though, is, like, you can hear what Oliver just said, like, hear that it's not you didn't mess up it's not that big of a deal but that circular thinking will keep right it doesn't matter how many yeah. people tell you it's not a big deal or how many people compliment you to make you feel better or anything how, how many pep talks you get it doesn't matter because you're still trapped on that yeah it's, thing. It's, it's whatever like it's called someone standing on the outside could be like you're okay you can get off of it if you just try right or it's, it's not like, i'm still trapped in the g-force isn't a big deal you can do it like you're still stuck there yeah you're still and so i think kind of you. what oliver's intentions were there was to yeah, be able to reassure your other people and not so right, much yourself right yeah like <laughs> knowing that your friend needs to hear that information yeah is or your friend your family member anybody needs to hear that information um, even if it might not help them, it's still better than doing nothing, yeah. I guess. No, I'm not trying to invalidate oh, yeah. um, people's, like, that kind of thinking by saying, like, like it's no big deal, but um, it's also, like, if it there's any, like, no it, big deal, it's good to it clarify that, that yeah. yeah. It's like good to clarify might, that yeah. a lot of it is just, like, um, making it bigger than it is. Huh. And I because of that, where it's like you're stuck in this loop, self-harm can also be a form of taking control. It could kind of be like getting you out of this loop, almost in a sense. It's like, okay, I can't really process anything that's happening. I can't really do anything. Here's this one thing that I can do that makes me feel something different than this constant cycle. It makes me feel a physical pain and not an emotional pain. So it's kind of their way of transferring the pain into something else so they can clear their mind. Mm -hmm. And back to my amusement park analogy. It's a good analogy. We're going to keep um, using it. You're stuck in it, and, like, you're scared because you can't get out of it, but then self-harming is, like, cutting the seatbelt, and then you, the ride, you're, you still can't get out of the ride, and you're still stuck in the ride. 
but you're being bashed around and now you're in pain and so you're thinking about that instead of the fear of being stuck in this like this amusement park ride yeah. and so and then soon a worker will come in and start yelling at you for cutting the seatbelt <laughs> yeah which is kind of like someone telling you to stop sounds hard right? yeah which isn't really helpful because they're just telling you to stop doing something but that you that's for the most part out of your control and you can't like, they'll be like, get out of the ride. Like, if I could, I would have already. <laughs> it's like, stop self-harming. I would if I could. Yeah. Like, what? Also, just telling them to stop and not giving them ways to stop is just dumb. Yeah. It's like, it's like can you maybe elaborate? Tell me how? Yeah, I would love to. That's a good segue, because we should... <laughs> um... Get off this amusement park. <laughs> get off the amusement park analogy. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but talking about, like... Um, ways to possibly like cope or what you can do instead or what sort of like I don't know just like what sort of things might help people yeah. get out of it ways to help people who are self-harming yeah I think first of all it's not going to be super helpful um to just yell at them to stop so that's um that's my main point, I guess, is that, like, if you know someone who self-harms, um, probably just, like, yelling at them, like, stop doing that or asking them why they're doing that is going to feel more invalidating and, like, bad than helpful. It's going to be feel yeah. more invasive. Yeah. yeah. Also. Which is going to feel worse. Also, yeah. you said, uh, ask them why they're doing that. Sometimes they honestly don't know why they're yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I don't, maybe, maybe they don't know, maybe they're just, they just do, and they can't quite figure out why they do it. Mm -hmm. they, they just, just feel do. bad and they're doing it. And it makes them feel better. They can't quite put their finger on, oh, here's what's causing you to do this. Here's the reasons I feel this way. Right. Because of that jumbled mess. It's kind of like, yeah. what Sometimes the hell's I happening It's me? probably not like a coordinated thought process and more of just like emotions, like you're angry and feel out of control. And so you do that and maybe that's transferred into more like, um, not necessarily calm, but maybe you feel like, a little bit more settled than before. I don't know. Um. So, before we like, continue on this, good topic. <coughs> self harm can literally be anything. A lot of people think it's cutting or just cut, like cutting their arms, cutting their legs. It could literally be anything. An eating disorder could be classified as self harm. Mm -hmm. Banging your head against the wall could be classified as self harm. Anything that makes you feel pain that you are doing to yourself could be classified as self-harm. Right, and I think some people um, say that, like, the pain doesn't really count if it's helping them feel better, but it absolutely does. Like, if you're harming your body in any way, it's still, like, you're still causing yourself pain whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, alternatives that I have actually thought of this time, um, we had a discussion about this a while ago and didn't incorporate it into the last episode, but we talked about, um, like, just, like, sound in general can be kind of helpful for some people. Like, whether that means, like, blasting really loud music, like, into your, like, headphones or speakers, whatever it is. Or just, like, going outside, like, yelling, however you can be loud that can, like, get your energy out, which maybe can help some people. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard people talk about exercise yeah. helps for some people. Like, if you can just, like, go outside and, like, run back and forth down the street, whatever it is um, you can do to, like, I think the main thing is just, like, try to get some energy out so that you don't feel so, like, overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. and a way that I've heard also helps is uh, gorging yourself on food, <laughs> which, I mean, I do every day, but, like, <laughs> but to just kind of, give you something else to focus on mm -hmm. other than the kind of... It also, the food makes you feel better. It makes you feel good. Right. Like a physical good. Right. You eat too much and then you feel sick so and just it's the like, whole thing. <laughs> just like, um, I guess, like comfort foods or comfort if there's... Foods, yeah. Or like treating yourself. Um, and that might not be like an easy thing for people who are struggling with like eating yeah. disorders or like unhealthy eating habits because that might make them feel worse. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it, if, if that helps people, that is a tip that I think works for some people. So if any of those are helpful, um, that's great. If not, um, you can always like let us know or comment or whatever um, so that we can give more helpful information 
Um, Because in the next episode, we're doing like the mental health series. I think we're going to be talking about self care, and we might incorporate some more stuff into that if we can actually get prepared. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so touching back to what to say to someone who is self harming, Mm -hmm. um, for it's really dependent on the person. I think if you know the person well enough, then you will probably know what is best to do when you figure out that they are self harming, and like. I know some people who would probably just prefer to be hugged, have nothing said, just being, like, there. And I know there are some people who would rather have someone sit down with them and have a conversation mm-hmm. and, like, get it out. So it's really specific, but there are definitely things not to do, which you did touch on, which is, like, don't definitely don't yell at them or ask, like, why are you doing this? Yeah. Stop don't, doing this. Don't shame them for it either definitely, because... Because they are... If it's self-hatred, they already feel bad enough doing yeah. it. And the, 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 at doing the self-harm will probably add to the self-hatred in general. Yeah. So like, shaming them for it is just pointless. Probably That's just making it worse. It more. Like, they probably understand that it's not a healthy habit and that it's not a good thing and that, like, they shouldn't be doing it. But um, that doesn't, like, give you the right to shame them for it because that, yeah, that'll just make it worse. It also doesn't mean that it's kind of, like, their choice. Like, it doesn't yeah. mean that they can just stop, even if they know yeah. that it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean that they could just, like, step out of it or fix it themselves. Yeah. Also, like, like shoving them into, like, a counseling room isn't going to fix it immediately. Telling yeah. them to stop it isn't going to fix it immediately. These things take time because it's obviously a big, it, deep-rooted issue that you're going to have to pull out which is going to take more than telling them to stop or setting them into one counseling thing. Yeah, however, counseling um, is you do good. mention counseling. If you have, like, a friend um, who, you know, a self army or a family member, whatever it is, um, if you can get them to some kind of professional help, um, that's at <coughs> least a start whether or not um, that ends up actually helping them. It's just, like, to get them to a professional and have that professional, like, know what they're doing um, might uh, help them in some way, whether that means, like, just letting someone know or whether that means that that person can actually help them. But, like, um, yeah, so just, like, take them to whatever social worker or guidance counselor Mm -hmm. or if you can get them to go to a therapist. A lot of people won't, but sometimes it just means, like, dragging someone to a social worker Mm -hmm. or, like, guidance counselor. Yeah, and... um like say someone comes up to you and like is trying to, telling you that you like they're self harming, it's it's your responsibility to help them and get, help them get help, but it's not your responsibility to, like be their therapist. Yeah, and like, you're not qualified. Most of us aren't qualified to deal with any of this. And sadly, some you, of us still have to deal. Like even if you are it. a qualified therapist and it's your friend who's coming to you for help, you still just because you're qualified doesn't mean you have to help. Yeah, that's it's like not... a very specific situation, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many therapists are watching this right now. <laughs> but if you are, are just choose what to do. Yeah. Also, like you shouldn't feel that your friend's problems are like if they're or whoever the person you're like dealing with, their problems shouldn't automatically like become yours. And they can sometimes. And when you're talking to someone who has a big issue like that, it can be super overwhelming. So you have to make sure that you're not taking on too much and yes, get your friend help and like support them and whatever, but don't um, like make it into a thing that you feel you have to solve because it's just that not gonna work take out. That a toll on your mental health. Yeah, yes, yeah, so like, you have to take care of yourself. Even if you have someone who is like self-harming and they're coming to you, your mental health still will come first. Like get them mm-hmm. help support them, but we can only focus on ourselves and make sure we are the best people we can be. And once everyone gets to that point, then yay. <laughs> Oscar, do you have anything to say? Um, not really about that specifically, but something that um, it's not on here. But something oh. that I was I, I will I'll take this, but it wasn't on here. Something that I was just thinking about a little bit while you guys were talking about that um, is the is like the stigma about self harm mm-hmm. um, and reasons why someone might not seek help. Because they're, like, and stigma ties into that. Because someone who's self-harming, um, there are a lot of reasons why they wouldn't get help. And, like, I know um, those examples that I've seen, people um, talk about their experiences with self-harm online. They talk about it, and then people in the comments are like, stop trying to get attention, you're just doing it for attention. 
you need to get professional help. Like some random internet guy telling you <laughs> in the YouTube comments yeah. to go see a therapist isn't going to make you see a therapist. Yeah. Especially, and then especially calling you attention seeking in the same comment. And mm -hmm. a lot of people say, oh, you're just doing it for attention. And usually that is not the case. Usually people are not doing it for attention. But people that do do it for attention, that is another sign of a deeply rooted problem. Right. Like not just you, being an attention Yeah. Brat. If you are so starved for attention and need to be noticed and, like, some, you need somebody to acknowledge you that badly th that, that you're willing to hurt yourself to, do, to get there, then that is another... That is another issue and another yeah, side there's, of, there's of a, a possible problem. There's a completely valid thing to feel. Yeah. It's not just, oh, my parents didn't buy me this. I'm going to yeah. try to get their attention through this. Yeah. Because no what I don't, maybe there's someone who would do that. I personally never encountered anyone who would yeah. self-harm for I think that attention in the bad sense. Yeah, a lot of people bad. say that people do stuff like this for attention. But, um, like, as you guys said, if you're doing it for attention, then that is a deeper problem. Um, so when you say, like when people say someone's doing something for attention, they usually mean it in like an insignificant sense and in like, um, I guess, saying that that person is just like being annoying and obnoxious and trying to like be cool or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know what I'm yeah. trying to say here. There's a deeper problem and nobody's just gonna do it for like the everyday kind of attention you can get for like something relatively like safe and normal. <laughs> There's also nothing wrong with wanting attention. Right. Yeah. Like it's it's a, human, it's a normal it's thing human. to want. Wanting some, to have wanting, people acknowledge wanting you. Wanting people in your life to acknowledge you as a person and to have respect and to have people um, ask you how you're doing and mm -hmm. just check in with you. Like that's a human thing. That's a very human right. thing to people feel. People like say it like a bad thing, but no, we all want attention in a sense. Even if you're really yeah. introverted, you still want to be acknowledged. On some level, you still, like, no matter how introverted you are, on some level, you you want pe other people to acknowledge your humanity, mm -hmm. which like, is... Hey, you exist. I see that. Congratulations. Yeah. And, and um, another reason people might not seek help is because of, like, pain Olympics type thing. Um, so, like, in a lot of mental health support groups, if you go, um, you can talk about your mental health issue, but then people will try to one-up you right. by saying, like, oh, I have it worse. Oh, you have depression? Oh, well, I have depression, and I'm schizophrenic, and, and then, and, 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 and all this stuff, and, and they'll try to invalidate what you're going through, because, mm -hmm. like, you could, like, a cisgender, heterosexual, white man living in America who suffers with depression is apparently not as valid as someone who is starving to death and also has depression. Like, no, those are both problems. Yeah, yeah one pain person is ha pain. One person has two different kinds of pain, and it might be more serious pain, but mental illness doesn't, doesn't pick and choose based on life situations. Right. Anybody of any demographic living anywhere in the entire world can suffer from a mental health issue. And undiagnosed or not, it is, it is not just a like a millennial thing. Like I know that there are right. some Ugh. baby boomers specifically who are like, millennials invented autism. Like, no, we definitely, definitely didn't. What does that even mean? No, but they're, they're like, back in my day, we didn't have autism. Like, yes, you did. People just didn't get diagnosed. Yeah, or you just Back like completely day, erased. Back in wasn't a thing. Like, like it, wasn't, it wasn't, oh, this person's autistic. It's, oh, this person's a little off and can't, communicate properly and bashes their head they against the table had worse for, words for no apparent reason. Yeah, it's not like, oh, this person is autistic and here's how we can help them. It's, oh, this person is weird and we're going to ostracize them. Right, so just because a group has been erased in the past doesn't mean they have been newly invented. Like, yeah, yeah. like trans also, people like, have always existed. on millennials. Like, right. you invented this <laughs> thing. No, the heck we didn't. We inherited this crap from you. Yeah. Like, it can be genetic. It's existed just a fact. forever. Like it's existed forever. It just hasn't been diagnosed. It also can be genetic. So like yeah, lots of shut the, up. Like, like mental illness, you can be predisposed to that. I'm very predisposed to mental illness because a lot of my family on both sides of a lot of people in my family on both sides, my my mother's and my father's side, suffer from some form <coughs> of mental illness. And so my sister and I are 
genetically predisposed to be mentally ill and I sh struggle with mental illness um, and um, and my mother has is a very anxious person my father he hates doctors he's very paranoid and he hates going to the doctor but my mother who is a, um, a, a medical professional uh, thinks I don't know that you end up together I don't know my mother thinks that he has ADHD and I believe that Bas just based on my, obviously I'm not a doctor, um, just based on my own personal experience with my father and with m the numerous people that I know in my, in my life who have um, ADHD. Um, he, um, and my grandmother on my dad's side, very, very anxious all the time. My, my, my aunt has OCD and bipolar disorder and depression and my mother has struggled with depression. And so, like, you, it's not your fault, basically. Mental illness is never your fault because it's, it, it's a genetic thing. It's a, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain. It isn't something that you are doing to yourself, and you're not it's faking like, it. It's like yeah, you getting don't control a cold it. isn't your fault. Yeah. It's not the same thing, but it's similar. It's still a sickness. Like, mental illness and, like, mental health and physical health should be treated the same. Right. Like, if somebody gets in a car crash and they almost die, they go to the hospital. Their family comes and they bring them flowers and like, oh my gosh, this is, so, this is so terrible that this happened. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. But then if somebody tries to kill themselves and they, they survive, they go to the hospital, suddenly everything's really hushed and everything's really taboo and, like, nobody wants to actually acknowledge what happened. Right. They, they just, they're just like, oh, it doesn't matter what happened. You, I just want you to get better. Like, oh. no, acknowledge the problem. Acknowledge what happened mm -hmm. and say... These are the steps we can take so that this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Also, in uh, schools, like, say you hurt yourself, like, you, like, hurt your arm, you will get a pass out of gym. Say you're socially anxious and you have to go to present, you have to present, and you tell your teacher that, the teacher's most likely going to say, oh, we're all nervous, get up there. You don't get a pass in school for mental illness, which is bull crap. Because yeah, if this person who has a hurt leg can sit out of the gym, then this person who has a mental illness should be able to sit out of this presentation. Yeah. Um, and you shouldn't, like, make, give them a bad grade for that. Yeah. That's just, yeah. I've had um, experiences with teachers. I have a teacher who, um, I guess, like, pretends he's an ally to all these people, but he's, like, the most... He's awful. Um, but he... I, I went to... So I have type 1 diabetes, and that means that I have to leave class quite a bit. Um, just to like go to the nurse's office and so I ask him like when I leave class to go to the nurse because that's a procedure and I ask him and he's like yeah always of course you can go and then I asked him one time if I could go see a social worker because I was like on the verge of a mental breakdown um, and I, I asked him I was like can I please just go um, like see the like go to guidance and he says, no, because this is your class, and your class is important. And he went on this huge rant about how, like, no, you don't get to just go do that because you have to come here, and this is important. And I tried to explain to him that mental health is more important than school, and he absolutely refused. But whenever there's a physical issue with my health, he's like, of course, go. It's so much more important than this. And it's just so unfair that schools and just, like, systems in general are wired to believe that physical health is more important than mental health. Did you just end up leaving? Like when he said, no, you can't Yeah, go. I just left. <laughs> just walked out, like, <laughs> bye. Yeah, I've done that in French before. Uh, we were yeah. just talking about My, this before. So, so I don't want to get into it, but I, I struggle a lot in French class for more reasons other than the fact that the material is hard. That's all I'll <laughs> say. Um, and there was one occasion where I was feeling very, like I was having a really bad mental health day, just I woke up and felt bad. And I was really anxious all day. I I had to have French near the end of the day, and I was very very anxious, um, and just very very jumpy. And I couldn't really focus on my work. And the teacher called me out. She was like, "Oscar, why aren't you focusing?" I said, "Oh, I'm just having I'm just having a hard day." She was like, "Whatever," and moved on. And then later, I asked for help, and she's like, "Oh, well, do you really want help? Because before you were just oh you were just saying you couldn't focus." And I'm like, "This is not valid." Yeah. You're not valid. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and so eventually I was like, can I go, can I just go take a walk? And she was like, no. And usually she, she, today I asked to go for a walk and she let me go, which was good. And I didn't go back to class because today <laughs> I was having another issue 
with her and I didn't go back to class. But that day I was like, I waited like 10 minutes. I was like, I have a migraine. Can I go to the office? Can I go to the nurse? And she was like, sure. Mm -hmm. Of course, for a headache, of course you can go. <laughs> And I'm like, this is not valid. Yeah. You can't do this. That's not okay. And you don't need to, you don't, like, you you shouldn't invade your students' privacy also to make sure they're, like, valid in their mental health struggle. Like, you shouldn't have to, like, my, my teacher, that time when he refused um, to let me go to guidance, he was like, why? Like, why do you need to go? Why are you on the verge of a you mental shouldn't. breakdown? Like, you don't get to ask that. And you don't, like, you don't get to have your students entire like mental health history um so that you can feel okay letting them go to guidance like it doesn't matter diagnosed undiagnosed if someone's having a rough time mentally you should like treat them the same as if they had something like physically like a physical ailment like you don't need medical records if you have to go to the nurse to get a band-aid so why do you have to like have yeah. that to go to guidance it's something I just hate in general is when teachers, like, you ask to, like, go for a walk, go to the bathroom, get a drink or anything. Teachers just say no. Like, yeah. excuse me, I'm not going to say, I got, I'm going to go to the bathroom, thank you very much. I have yeah. to go. What is this, the army? Yeah. Where, where some random adult who just knows a little bit more about the English language than me is going to prevent me from going to the bathroom? What is this? <laughs> or, like, no, you can't go for a walk. I can I can just leave like, the watch right me. there. I can just <laughs> go. Watch me. Like, as long as I'm in the school building, yeah. I'm legally obligated to be in the school. I'm not in your class. Bye-bye. And, and just circling back to the, the guidance thing. <laughs> Good tangent, Jules, but just go, going back for a second. Um, I'm not, I don't want to speak for, for every school. Not, not every school in our district, let alone in Vermont or America or the world. But... In our school district, going to guidance isn't like a fun time. It's yeah. not like it's not like you go and you just get to like hang out. Like you go and like <laughs> lot of you get time. asked like a hundred questions a second. You're probably by, gonna cry by any person. Usually there's crying. There's most of the time. Or there's crying. just like no one there to or staff no the guidance there. room, and you just go in there and like sit yeah. on the floor, and you're like, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like our guidance counselor is on family leave, and there's no substitute. Yeah, she's she's been gone for like half a year, and they don't do anything about it. And, and like then no the stuff. other one has like um, the social worker has like a schedule with individual like pre-scheduled meeting times, and I don't blame either of them for that. But like, you literally, if you're having a rough mental health time, and you're not allowed, you get a detention if you're in a classroom alone. So <laughs> there's like no solution. So you just have to leave the classroom and either like wander around the hallways or like I sit do. on the floor and hope they don't notice yeah. you. The thing like is, there's like, you don't get a sub. You expect all your students to be perfectly mentally yeah. fine. For an entire year, no, we're in middle school. Yeah. It's just weird, because then I, I'll go in, and I'm just, like, there, because like, I, like, I need to talk to someone, and there's no one in the office, so I just, like, sit there. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And also, at the same time, like, teachers shouldn't expect us to be mentally well if there is a guidance counselor. Like, one yeah. visit to guidance isn't going to, like... Like, ooh, -hoo, my depression is cured because I went to <laughs> guidance. Like, that's not how it works. So depression can't really be cured. Valid. Like, it could be better. Like, people think with, like, uh, antidepressants, like, oh, that's a cure. No, it's like, right, no, right. It's, it's no treatment. Yeah, it's a treatment. Tre there's a difference. I still have this thing just because I'm on these pills doesn't yeah. mean, oh, I'm mentally better. I'm totally fine and I'm happy and no. you would never have a depressive both. episode ever and yeah. never <laughs> feel bad ever. Yeah. Just to give you guys a little bit of uh, hope for high school <laughs> next year. Um, so it's it's set up in a really different way. So the guidance counselors aren't really mental health people. They're more there to help you with like your schedule and stuff. Right, right. And so if you want to talk to someone, you have you have to go see the social worker or the nurse. Both of them are very good about stuff. And um, if neither of them are there, n nobody's like following you around the hallway or monitoring you. <laughs> right. And like. You can just like go sit somewhere, like in the hallway. You can sit outside the hallway, or you can go sit in the library, mm -hmm. or literally anywhere, <laughs> and you can just like hang out. Yeah. And for the most part, teachers aren't gonna come out of their classrooms to come hunt you down. Right. If they ask you why were you gone for so long, and like you some say, binoculars I, I went to go out, see, like... I went to go see the, the social worker, they'll be like, oh okay, and they won't get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. So just just that's that's Thank a good you. thing that the school does well. Good. And yeah. Like, we have, You're like, talking... two weeks to survive, so. <laughs> you were talking about uh, nurses. Our nurse is so amazing. Like, I needed to just sit and just talk to a... Oliver. 
and I walked in. I walked into her, and I had gym, and I walked in, and I was like, "Hey, I'm not hurt. Can you give me a pass for gym? I need to go like sit down and deal." And he's like, "Yeah, sure. Here you go." I walked into the gym, gave it to them. They were like, "Okay, bye, kid. Whoever you are." And then I just sat there. They just left. What? And you just left? I just left. And yep. the nurse like gave me a pass, no questions asked. I don't think I got a pass that time. I just left. I don't think you did. I'm pretty sure you just came with me. You know what? It's but fine. like, it's okay. I'm pretty sure you were skipping science. That's valid. <laughs> but also like... Don't skip school, kids. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, I mean, you no. have to like prioritize because you have to be able to... Um, we're very off topic. We really are. We have. To, you have to it's be okay. able to like prioritize um, all your stuff like you should go to school if you can but also um like we're going to talk about mental health days at some point in the future um but you also have to be able to like let yourself like leave class and don't shame yourself for taking breaks don't let other people shame you either yes don't take that bull crap if someone's like yelling (laughs) at you for self-harming just like Get up, flip them off, and leave. That's what I would do. Honestly, I mean, I wouldn't... Don't swear at them. That's a bad idea. Don't take my advice. I'm very sorry. Just, like, don't let them push you around or shame you. Like, even... Like, you're allowed to stand up for yourself. You're allowed to, like, say, I'm not going to sit here and take this. Bye. Guys, someone please keep talking. I don't know what I'm saying. uh, So, going off of what you were saying, like... Um, a symptom or just a part of having a mental illness is you never think that you are right in a situation. Oh. Like you um, arguing with someone and you think that you're right while you're arguing, but then afterwards you're like, I'm not right. This isn't real, whatever, you whatever. Like and you too. And you try to validate their opinion and their, their thoughts in, in your head, no matter how awful their opinions were. Like um, I was bullied a lot when I was younger, which contributes to some of my mental health stuff. And so, and just due to the nature of the bullying, um, in my head, whenever someone's being mean to me, because I was bullied by someone who was, um, who was at that time my friend. And so in my head, whenever someone's being mean to me, I always try to rationalize it. And I was like, oh, well, I did this. And oh, well, they, here's where they're coming from. Like I try yeah. to rationalize it and validate it and excuse it in a way. But I know, but, I have, but I've been working on not letting that happen and just being like, no, that person is a shitty person. Sorry, that, that person is bad, is a bad person. That is yeah. a bad person and they don't care about my feelings and I don't need to validate them. Right. Mm-hmm. And in a calm, rational argument, it is fine to see the other person's point of view, but like what else we're saying, don't make excuses for it. Like, I do yeah, this all can... the time, and I will go to my friends, and I'm like, hey, here's what's happening. What's your opinion? And then they'll tell me all the things that I thought beforehand and convince me of my argument. Because, like, I need them to. Because I'm like, well, crap, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm... Yeah, this kind of connects to what we were talking like, about earlier myself. about, like, talking to your friends. Because you should be able to talk to your friends, and then they can, like, give their opinions and I think that can be as you said like a helpful tool for validating your own opinions and also like a way to using give you like kind seeing of like other people's to yeah. be able to stand up for yourself and say stop shaming me yeah bye yeah so seeing like your friends and other people's points of view without turning that into a way to invalidate yourself mm-hmm. I guess that's like a takeaway I don't know what we're talking what did what do the notes say? Literally so nothing else. The have... whole thing is the hotlines and then reasons why people self harm. I'm so good at taking wow. notes. Thanks, they say nothing Jules. else. Um, so I think that maybe we should tie this into the the theme of this <laughs> show, which is LGBT stuff. Oh, yeah. So true. LGBT youth, so that LGBTQ youth, so that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning plus uh, plus whatever else are at a higher like a dramatically higher risk of suicide and mental illness and self-harm. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for that because some people who don't want to acknowledge how privilege works um, <laughs> will say, oh, it's just a coincidence. Oh, blah, 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 all that like, stuff. Like, ignore like, the fact that no, when, like, not. data like, and crap, and like, how? No, no, it isn't a coincidence. And there's a reason that this demographic, specifically youth, those mm-hmm. LGBTQ youth are at a much higher <coughs> risk 
for depression and anxiety and, and that could be attempting a suicide or self harm and it it like this there there's a pattern there and it's mm -hmm. not just a random statistic it's yeah. and i think that part what we should is that we should we should talk about that yeah. why that might be so yeah. about that. i think well, that it all but, like t mm, okay okay just quickly before we do that <laughs> um we will talk about that i just want to make something very clear Suicide and self-harm are two very different things. Mm -hmm. You can self-harm and not be suicidal. You can be suicidal and not self-harm. They're different things that just happen to be sometimes closer to each other in certain situations. Yes. Oliver, you may talk about. Yeah, so they can connect, but they don't have to. Yes. yes. Um, is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I was just saying that as like an overarching yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I was just um, clarifying. So it all sort of, I think, like ties together into heteronormativity because... And sexism. Yes, all of it. Um, because... Um, we were talking about like self-hatred earlier and I think for queer kids a lot of the time um, that can be tied into internalized homophobia and transphobia which we discussed a little bit um, before at some point in the last episode we discussed I think. something at yes. some point <laughs> related to <laughs> this topic what I'm trying to say. Um, but I think so yeah self-hatred can be connected to heteronormativity in that way which all just makes it like more likely for queer kids to self-harm um, and I think it's awful that yeah. that like those heteronormative thoughts are so like deeply ingrained in our society that it literally makes kids like more likely to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. It can also be a, <laughs> can, I, can also be a cause of um, bullying too, like mm -hmm. Oscar was saying you like try to excuse them and like you try to rationalize it and then you maybe start to believe what they're saying right. and that can lead into self-hatred so like having someone say oh you're an awful person or whatever they say to you and then you rationalize it and you make it and you, like you make sense of it and you start to feel that way and it's yeah this whole cycle and just like timeline of everything that's happened and that leads to kind of the sad ending where either potentially they could commit suicide or they could start to self-harm and again yeah. they're separate things yeah. yeah like growing up in um a society that tells you that your attraction to someone is wrong. Your gender is wrong. That you aren't. That your gender isn't isn't real. That your pronouns aren't real. That you're just making stuff up for attention um, is really really harmful. Yeah. And like one of the the hardest times for me was when I had when I was forcing myself to be feminine because I knew that because I thought that I had to, and because I was so angry about being feminine, I had my, like, this was when I was 13, so I was like, I don't really know how anything works at all. I was like, oh, I must be a lesbian because they're masculine, which is not the truth, which is not a yeah, thing. Problematic. But <laughs> my heteronormative brain was like, lesbians are always masculine, and that's how you know when you see one. That's how you can identify one. They're wearing flannel and a beanie. It's a lesbian. And so I want to be masculine, so I must be a lesbian. Not the truth. I am a gay trans guy. Very different. So, very different. And <laughs> not so, a lesbian. Not even close. No, not even remotely. <laughs> and so, and when I was forcing myself into that identity that didn't fit me and I was still uncomfortable, that was so hard for me. Mm -hmm. And I was just go, and I was going through a lot, like being 13 for one, you're going through a lot. Just, just being that age is hard. <laughs> and, um, and then on top of trying to make sense of, how you're feeling when you don't have words for it is very hard and when nobody wants to talk about it yeah. and uh, like at school a teacher who is gay might not talk about their partner or might not have pictures of their of them with their partner like heterosexual teachers just have like their yeah. wedding pictures up but um it's uh, adorable it's so cute but, to see that. but a queer teacher might be more hesitant to yeah. to put up a photo of them and their um same gender partner Right, and that like causes it. That causes like students to not have a sense of normalcy when it comes around yeah. it, which again leads back to self hatred. Like I'm not normal. No one else I know is like this. No one else is talking about it. No one else is guiding me in a sense. I'm not normal. Yeah, because even like queer people don't talk about their queerness sometimes just because of um, heteronormative yeah. and cisnormative society. So if you're a kid in school 
and you're like, well, all my teachers are straight and cis. Well, they might not be, but they're probably not talking about it because probably the school system's going to shame them for it, or they're going to get like you get fired. in trouble it's with possible to get yeah. Fired. Some parent is going to get angry because they're homophobic or transphobic, whatever it is. And so it all just leads back to this discussion not being had, and the same goes for mental health. So it all mm -hmm. just sort of like connects yeah. into an awful and mess. Like, I used to think that all of my friends were straight and cis, <laughs> and look at me now, I have no straight and cis friends, because, yeah. well then again, I have no friends, but still. We call it. <laughs> but like, I used to think that I was completely alone, and then people started to be able to like talk about it more with like having the GSA in our school and having it kind of being more broadcasted in our school. Yeah. People were able to kind of do that, and I was like, oh, holy crap. Yeah, we I'm had, not like, our... weird. Well, I'm still weird. All, we they like all come out of the woodwork. Yeah, the we closet. have like our all, straight all cis closet. friend group. Um, <laughs> we sit with that lunch. When we were in, like for a while, and then eventually we all just like came out Slowly to each other. We were like, and now we're just, we're literally all queer. There's like, like not was, a like, single Oliver, person. Hey, I'm, I'm queer. And Oliver was like, oh, hey, same. And then, and then I'm like, hey, I'm trans. And you're like, cool. So am and I. And then two, two months later, you're like, same. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> We all just like group together. They, we, we flock together without even knowing it. Like, are. like my two best friends in the whole world, when, we, when I first met them, um, one of them said to me, and I specifically remember this because I thought it was so funny, because at this point I was, I was like, I'm a lesbian because I'm, so now I have an excuse to be masculine and I get a pass now, which, which is very harmful <laughs> thinking that I yeah. blame on heteronormative society. Um, and I don't at all encourage to think like that because that's not true. Um, I was already out as like being being a lesbian, and my friend who my friend Max back then he, his name wasn't Max, but I'm not in the business of dead name. I people. love Max. I know he's my I son. Love Max. And I love him. He's like so. He so said to me, tall. and I remember this. I remember this so strongly because it's so funny to me now. He he says, um, "Well, I'm living proof that hanging out with um, gay people doesn't make you gay." And now That's Max. What happened to us. And now oh, Max shit. is um, is trans and he is dating a boy and it's um and I just thought that that was and on my friend Alvi said to me um once dead name if you were a boy you'd be gay and I said says who <laughs> and, and pause for laughs and then um my friend and then I said to Alvi well dead name because his name wasn't Alvi then well, dead name, you, if you were a girl, you'd be a lesbian. And then Alvi says to me, yeah, because I like girls, which is not the case. <laughs> Alvi is very non-binary and very queer. And just, we all just start as cishets who are confused and we flock together somehow knowingly. Yeah. And then all we all just gradually are like, we, hmm. I had a mind-blowing discovery as we were talking. <laughs> I came out right after I joined GSA. What the frick? I think it's just probably oh, because wow. your um, queerness was buried <laughs> like, it was, so it, like, deeply. Awoke. Yeah, it was like hello. It was I'm here now. It was buried, so it's. I think. Well, like jokes aside, kids grow up thinking they're cishet because. Or be or yeah, like shaming that's themselves. That's default. Yeah. Yeah, because that's default. Straight yeah, don't have to come out. So that's why. Um, no, that was that was correct. Okay, I support you. You're valid. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that's why this is such a common experience having your friend group like all suddenly turn queer. Turn like, queer. Like we were queer the whole time, but society raised us to like they they just put on this outer layer on us that's like the cishet versions of us, and then eventually when we like really realize like find the words. Um, and like validate our own feelings or have them validated by someone else, we can like break out of that and shed that and get rid of it. And then like, it's just, it's weird that we have to go through this whole extra transformation process just because we're not mm -hmm. set. And that's another thing Bad. that I have to say about baby <laughs> boomers is there, there's like, this generation, everybody's gay now and everyone's bisexual, like gay whatever too, that means. It, it's just a trend now. Like, no, Rebecca, it's not a trend. <laughs> God, or Rebecca. More people are just like, if I say that I'm gay or trans, I'm not going to get murdered instantly. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. people feel um, safer to actually 
Like, the population of gay people has always been high. It was just illegal to be gay up until, like, 60 years ago. <laughs> Um, maybe less. So don't even give me that, Rebecca. You are wrong, okay. and you're not I valid. Can leave? Um, you said turning queer, and for some reason it made me thought of werewolves, and you're like, oh no, the full moon is here. I become fabulous. I don't know why, but that's just what that I thought. That was really not. A, I'm not seeing. That was a non sequitur. You're not seeing yeah. it. Come on, imagine no. it. Like you, it's the full moon, so. and you just turn rainbow. Jules, as much as I enjoy your strolls down non sequitur <laughs> lane, um, no. You shouldn't do it. I'm so <laughs> sorry. No. You shouldn't do it when you're being filmed. <laughs> um, the topic at hand. <laughs> we have been on a, ta a tangent for you a long what? time. That's okay. About an hour? Was a <laughs> I feel like we connected, we kind of connected some of this yeah. stuff together because a lot of these ideas, Except like, we we right? you can go on a rant about, um, like, any of these topics, and it all just ends up connecting also, in the end. Literally, yeah. our show structure is just ranting, you guys. It's okay. Mm -hmm. it's I think fine. It's, it's fine to like. Don't invalidate my rant. Back to our original topic. We were talking about self harm, and we were. oh, um, we were. I forgot. <laughs> right. And one thing that some people find helpful because we talked about like alternatives. This isn't a direct alternative, but if you're struggling with this stuff, one thing, one strategy you can use is calling a hotline. Um, or a text line, and yes, these are this, this is just community. like helpful numbers, and you can just call these up, and there will be someone there who uh, just like talks to you, and you can just like um, like gush to them about all your problems and also whatever. Also, a way of avoiding gushing to your friends and like taking yeah. Care of their and if health. you don't have like a supportive group to be in, if you're um, surrounded by assholes. Here's what to do. Yeah. You can, or if you're surrounded by people who support you, but it's just, like, too much to talk to them about it. Um, Especially because, like, they're a part of your life, too. Like, you see them every yeah. day, and it's like, oh, hey, I know that you're doing that thing. Yeah. These people Sorry. don't even have a face when you talk to them. Yeah. Like, oh, so here's this voice. I'm that's a gush. helpful strategy. So if you want to read off the hotline. So, so the first one is, it just says Suicide P. I assume that's Suicide Prevention, Prevention Hotline. It's um, 1-800-263- 8255 and the Trevor Project which I have called before to talk about stuff is very good I would definitely recommend it the person who picked up had a lovely Australian accent and she was very nice oh, fun. Um, I love accents the, <laughs> uh, their number is 212-695-8650 now let's hope I got those numbers right and um, and an alternative because calling the number is um, hard sometimes because you're so um, like if you're very anxious and calling talking on the phone makes you anxious. Um, you if you it's I'm alive I think dot it's I think it's I'm alive dot org. But if you just Google I'm alive as all one word, it brings you to an online um, chat like crisis. I'm also pretty chat sure line. you can text the suicide hotline. Yeah, I've tried. It, it takes a really long time to get in though. Um, because they, they get, there's this, there's like a queue. Um, oh, annoying. And so you have to wait in line for someone to be available. Oh. Because if no one is available, they just route you to another call center, but they don't have enough people who are, um, you, they can route you to um, if you try to text. So you can text, right. but um, it you're less likely to get in in time to, ha to like process something before you like do something rash, like self-harm. Yeah. Um, so so think... you can call them or just... I'm alive, all one word, um, and it should be one of the top results. And it's an online texting thing, so you, it, you won't get billed for using data um, if you have minute by minute um, phone bill. Um, and it's um, confidential, so you don't—they don't—they don't ask for names. They don't ask for well, they ask for names, but you don't have to give them your name. Um, and they everything is private, and the chat deletes automatically. So yeah, that's so also that's a it's a good way to. Um, like get out your feelings or if you're in like a like a panicky moment and you can't talk to someone in real life or if that's stressful or whatever it is that's a really good way to um, calm yourself down or get some kind of solution to your problem through that or those people could give you like tips um, to help you with future situations so that's a good strategy thank you for watching this has been all things lgbtq youth, youth edition, edition. Next time we are on, we'll be talking about um, self-care, continuing with our mental health series. S see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>